ESPN, the Total Sports Network, and the Professional Bowlers Association tonight brings you the $115,000 Austin Open from the Highland Lanes in Austin, Texas. Tonight's telecast is being brought to you by Columbia 300. By your neighborhood True Value Hardware Store. Here's a look at tonight's step ladder format. Wayne Webb, it's been 15 months since he last won. He'll be ready and he'll bowl against rookie Rod Pasteur. In the number three slot, Kent Wagner out of Palmetto, Florida. Then the guy who possesses the number one strike ball on the tour, John Gant, bowls out of the number two position. And on top, it's Steve Cook shooting for $16,000 in first place prize money. Hello, everybody. I'm Denny Schreiner, and welcome to Highland Lanes in Austin, Texas, for tonight's finals of the $115,000 Austin Open. The locals around the Texas area like to do one thing, do things in a big way. Perhaps that's why Steve Cook at 6'7", 260 pounds, is the top seed player for tonight's telecast. One other vital statistic to point out concerning tonight's finalists is the fact, Mike Durbin, that uh, there's only one player in the field that's 29 years of age, and he's the old man. We certainly do have young players on our show tonight. There's three 28 years old, one 25 year old, and Steve Cook is 29 years old. Well, while these guys may be young, and that kind of grieves my heart a little bit, Dan, because I like to see some of those shows where we have those 40 plus year olds like Dale Eagle, these guys are not without experience and talent. Between Wayne Webb and Steve Cook, we have 20 years of experience and 26 PBA titles. So they possess a lot of talent. However, life on the tour is a little bit tough, and I noticed with Wayne Webb, a little gray creeping in around his temples there, so life on the tour tells its tale in the long run. Well, perhaps Wayne has already begun to think about bowling a very talented rookie, Rod Pastor, out of Miami, Florida. Making his second appearance on a championship round this year. Rod Pastor is a very smooth five-step left-handed player. Gets to the line very smoothly, throws a medium hook, very, very accurate. Seems a very confident and intelligent young player. He's in the running for the Rookie of the Year. If he would win tonight, he would have an outstanding chance to become Rookie of the Year. And obviously, he's a black player. And we've never had a black player win a PBA national tournament. But we've never had a foreign player win a national PBA tournament until Mats Carlson did it two weeks ago. So maybe Rod Pasteur can make a breakthrough here tonight in Austin, Texas. Mike, I have the feeling that Wayne Webb is just about ready to explode. Well, he certainly hopes he's ready to explode. He says that he's been in the worst slump of his life. What he's done, though, is gone back to basics. He said he had fallen into the trap of trying to hook the ball too much. So he's worked very hard on his hand release to straighten out his ball, not make it hook quite so much, and to become more effective and get back to the winning ways that he had in recent years when he won 16 PBA titles. He's got a rough road ahead of him tonight, though, because he has to win four games to get that 17th PBA title. We do have the classic confrontation this evening, Mike Durbin, because there are three left-handers and two right-handers in the finals. Left-handers haven't fared too well in recent weeks, but we have three up in the top five tonight. And we have an excellent chance for a left-hander, obviously, of winning this tournament. Steve Cook had not cashed since he won the opening tournament on our ESPN telecast the beginning of the summer. He wants to cash in a big way and win 16000 tonight in Austin, Texas. And stay tuned, because the opening match is just a minute or so away. It'll provide something old and something new. Wayne Webb and Rod Pasteur. Just about ready for the opening match in the $115,000 Austin Open. Featuring Wayne Webb on your right and rookie Rod Pasteur out of Miami, Florida. On the left. Wayne Webb will open up the match on lane 19. Championship pair here, 19 and 20. At the Highland Lanes in Austin, Texas. Wayne Webb will be starting the ball out around the second arrow, sending it out to about the fourth board. Comes in light, the first shot leaves the 2-8. Not an easy spare to start off with. Wayne Webb averaging 221.4 this week through 42 games had a high game of 279 and very nearly led this tournament as a matter of fact with just a couple of games left he was only 25 or 30 pins out of first place considering he's only been averaging 208 for the year which is down for him the 221 average and he bowled considerably better this week and he's in trouble 
fails to convert the 2-8 to open up the first frame and falls behind right away. Wayne has struggled in the championship round this year, shot 147 in the opening telecast on the winter tour and lost to Randy Peterson and then shot 177 against John Adrabinak. It's not too good an average. First shot for the rookie from Miami, Florida, and the nerves certainly weren't evident with the first shot, Mike. Rod Pastor, what he needs to do is keep his speed up. He throws the ball with medium speed to slow speed as it is, and the lanes seem to be hooking quite a bit, especially at the back end of the lane. So if he gets soft at all, then it's going to run high through the nose. Rod beat Joe Salvemini, 246 204 in the position round game last night to solidify his position on this evening's telecast. So he can bowl under pressure. Would like to open up with a double here and put the pressure on Wayne Webb. There's just what we were talking about. A little softer speed, not quite as clean a release. He didn't get it. his thumb out of the ball as clean that time. And the ball ran high. He's fortunate he only left the forefinger. Only 25 years of age, 5'9", 150 pounds, and has three regional titles to his credit already. Did that within a year's time. As a matter of fact, he won his first regional title, and his application was still being processed in Akron, Ohio, at the PBA, so he got ahead of things. Well, I always tell guys when they talk about going out on the tour to try the regional program first, is if they can do it out there, then they've got a chance to beat the big guys. But if they can't beat them in their local area, they'll never beat them in the national area. Oh. Webb ball's breaking sharply right through the nose, leaves the 3 6 10. Wayne Webb, now 28 years of age, 5'5", 150 pounds, very, very strong for his size. And I think he's shooting this off of his strike line, then. He is. Throwing a big hook at it, and makes it look easy. Interesting, my approach to those spares like that was always to shoot it from the left and uh, throw the ball straight at the 3 6 10. But we see Webb, he just moved a little bit left here. The ball is going to go right around the second or a little left of it. Now out to about the fourth board and hook back to make the 3 6 10. A little better reaction that time. Just a better hand release than he got in the first frame is all the only difference. It's interesting you mentioned hand release because he told me just yesterday that. For the last year or so, he has he has struggled with his hand position and his release. He's, I just can't seem to get the feel. And this week, the last couple of weeks, he has started to bowl better. He, he's struggling. He, somehow he always manages to make 100000 at the yeah. end of the year, and he's struggling with the hand release. Well, when you mention money, thus far he's won only 31000 He won 127000 last year, so he is behind schedule. There's the speed he's looking for. And oh, what a bad break. Leaves a solid 10 on a flush pocket hit. Rod kind of gives it an evil look there. <laughs> well, I don't think he was particularly pleased with that absolutely perfect flush shot. Watch the three pin, third from the right. And it goes to the wall, comes back so fast that it missed the 10 pin. And we see his reaction. <laughs> he has to turn around twice to look at it. He had that one written up. Does it ever help, Mike, when you look back? Do they ever fall down? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> well, well that, that's just got to tear you up because when you come out and you really throw a great shot, to leave a solid hit like that is tough. It's tough, but it's not as tough the fact that he was working on the spare. If you were going to try and get a double and left something like that, then it really demoralizes you. Rod had a high game this week of 279. Average just a fraction better than 220 for the tournament. En route to qualifying fourth. Well. On the crossover and it hit the thumb hole. Well, it certainly wasn't a good shot, but he did get a break. And at this point in time, Rod Pasteur leads by 10. $25,000 if any of the pros shoot a 300 game here on ESPN this summer, courtesy of the great folks at True Value Hardware Stores. Uh, a dozen in a row, Mike? Is it really that tough? Well, I don't know. Uh, our statistician over here, Joe Berardi, is uh, writing his name in on that check right away here. So, <laughs> <laughs> Told us he'd take us all out to dinner after the show, too. Well, he's got to get out there to do it, mm -hmm. though. Well, we got to talk him into making a finals here in the next week or so. He did it, though, a few years ago in Buffalo. It was not on live television as Wayne Webb throws a double. 
Wayne, Wayne was in a situation where he was very close to not making the telecast, and he made the comment, hey, if I don't make the show, I'm going to quit bowling. I thought that there was no way that I could miss a telecast. I was bowling real good, come out last night, I couldn't win a game, had a couple of bad games, and uh, came down to the last ball, but I'm here. Really did. Said he was going to hang up the shoes. Of course, I'm sure that was tongue-in-cheek. He has been known to make comments from time to time. Well, all of us have been known to, comments. to make little comments as Webb leaves the two-pin on a light hit. What Wayne Webb is doing here, Dan, is he's using one ball on the right lane and another ball on the left lane here. And uh, that's very unusual. You don't do that too often, but one lane, evidently, it appears the left lane is a little tighter for him. So he's probably using a ball that hooks a little bit more on the left lane, one that goes straighter on the right. Still very much in the match at this point. One interesting note, we have had a rookie on the telecast four consecutive weeks, and unfortunately for the rookies, the youngsters, they have yet to win a match. Well, Rob Pastor says he's going to put an end to that. Pastor trying for a double, trying to increase his lead from 1 to 11. No solid 10 pin that time. And in speaking with Rod before tonight's telecast, I asked him, how tough is it for a rookie to go through such a talented field and win a title? Well, today I think it'll be extremely tough because I guess I haven't, I don't think I've had as many television appearances as other guys, but in a way that can work as a plus or a minus. And for me, hopefully it'll work as a plus. Trying for three in a row has been high both times on lane 19. It's high one more time, and this time pays the penalty, leaving the 4-7-10. appears he's playing a little further to the left on lane 19. He's not playing out as far uh, on the right lane as he is on the left lane. You see the ball right here hooking sharply right through the heart of the pins, and it doesn't break him up this time. No good break as he had back when he left just the four pin. He's probably going to go for this. And, yeah, and he misses them all. Boldly tried for it. Loses the count. Put him in a, it's going to put him behind in the match. Rod's performance, a classic case of showing the average bowler that the lanes are so much different from time to time. One lane from the other. And you have to con constantly make those adjustments. They look the same, but they don't necessarily play the same. They never play the same. <laughs> Webb, a nice shot, leaves a four pin on the right lane. Wayne Webb won back-to-back -back tournaments last year, something only, uh, what, three players, three other players in PBA history have ever done. Well, he's, he did it. As we see the re replay here of his four-pin shot ball, just a little bit tight, he did it for the third time in his career, Danny, Wow! that he's won back-to-back -back tournaments. He sticks shooting the four-pin. Bill Allen did that a number of times, and I'm sure old Anthony must have done it, but it's a very difficult feat to perform is winning back-to-back -back tournaments. And what, Johnny Petraglia, Mark Roth, and Dick Weber? The other three? When you got me, I'll have to uh, look it I up. think so, I think so, yeah, as a matter of fact. And for Wayne Webb, he has won two tournaments in each of the last six years coming into 1986. He's a little behind schedule right now. He says it's going to be a little tougher this year. Back in the pocket, leaves the soft 10. As he's got it working pretty good, gets in the pocket of one ball on the left lane on lane 19, another ball on the right lane. Wayne Webb with the unusual delivery holds the ball down and watch his head as he lets the ball go. His head goes to the left and it appears that he never sees his target. He must hit something out there with all the success that he has had. And at this point in time, he leads by six pins. We'll be back with the conclusion of match number one right after this. Rookie Rod Pasteur, only 25 years of age, and he is an outstanding talent. And interestingly enough, he got zero on that uh, four, seven, ten. If he'd got two, he would only be two pins behind instead of six. Is that a rookie mistake? Not necessarily. Uh, he had to go for it, and mm -hmm. he just calculated wrong. He's had every ball in the one-two pocket on the right lane. And this one is, too. Interestingly enough, 
He picked a finish on lane 19. He has not hit the one-two pocket on it yet. Now, Mike, what kind of an adjustment will Rod make now on the left-hand lane? He has gone through the nose high on the last three shots. Do you maybe loft a little more, use more speed? What, what do you think he'll do? Any of those are options. Personally, what I would do is I would move a board or two to the right and keep that same strike target. Uh, he's just the ball's hooking too soon on him on that left lane. He needs to get more arc, and the way you do that is you move your feet to the right if you're a left-handed player. And Rod has opted for one of three re-racks. Players allowed three official re-racks for each and every game, should they decide to take them. And I think he did do just that. I was watching his feet, and it looked like he moved over a little bit more to the right. Yeah. Oh, baby. And he got a good result. There's the, there's the pro adjustment right there. Confidence, too, to strike on that left-hand lane, considering it stymied him in the past. And to take the lead with that strike. As we see that he swings the ball out, left of the second arrow and it goes out to about the fifth board comes in light and just saws the five into the ten Webb up very quickly on lane 20 and leaves the two for ten saw a number of those this week in the match play portion of the austin open and it's remarkable how many guys can make this and there's wayne webb's parents looking on not too happy at this stage of the game they on vacation out in Kansas City, all the way from Rehoboth, Massachusetts, if I could say that. They decided they were in the neighborhood. Oh! They were in the neighborhood of Kansas City and thought, well, geez, Wayne has been struggling. We'll pop in and give him a surprise visit, give him a little support, and it has worked <laughs> this week. Wayne Webb boldly going for the 2 4 10, hitting the 2 pin on the left side, sending it over into the 10, keeping himself in the match. It's ninth frame action. He switches balls again. Light and leaves the hard 10. The six pin just wrapped quickly around that 10 pin. How difficult is it, Mike? The two different bowling balls on two different lanes, but both of those balls probably have a little different feel, too, so you're making the adjustments there as well. It just shows you, um, it's a demonstration of Wayne's confidence. He is also an equipment player, isn't he? In many respects, uses a lot of different bowling balls. A lot of different bowling balls. Drills up new ones every single week. Converts to 10 pin. I did it once in 1981 in Cleveland. I used uh, two different balls on the show, one on one lane, one on the other, and wound up winning the tournament, so it, it can be done. But like you say, there is a different feel to each volleyball. Rod Pastour steps up in the ninth, the foundation frame, leads by eight, and would love to get himself a turkey here and in the ninth. Destiny is in his hands. Ooh, nice shot, and just didn't quite strike leaves the six pin he was just a little right of his target that time i was really surprised the ball held as well as it did rod's bowling goals to win and be the number one player one of these days one of these days huh? <laughs> cross lane at the six pin has the spare Heads into the 10th frame, seven pins up. The best he can get right now, if he strikes all the way out, is 209. The best Webb can get is 202. So again, the bowler that performs in the 10th frame, as so often happens on our telecast, is the one that's gonna merge the winner of this first match. Made the adjustment last time on 19 and came in light. That light hit again. He needs one more now. These are really slow one. This is the old wall shot. Watch the head pin. Goes to the wall, comes back, and gets out the five, six, ten. That in itself, a very big break. But this is now the critical shot. If he strikes here, Wayne Webb will be in some serious trouble. Yeah, if he strikes here, you don't even need four pins to win. I think. I could handle that. Right. I didn't say that. <laughs> Big shot. He's looking at it. Oh, he walked away from it. Big smile on his face, too. Rod Pasteur knew when he let it go that he was ready to advance into the next game. His best shot of the match right here. Solid in the one-two pocket. All ten pins in the pit. And Boy, that he ball saw just it, and he was driving. walking away from it. He knew it. <laughs> That's a confident young man. Four pins now. Stay behind the foul line and keep it on the lane. 
And that's a nice way to win a game in the championship finals. Back with four, and he wants all of them, but ends up with nine. Nice performance. And there's the handshake from Wayne Webb, who really continues to struggle in the championship round. Well, he's not going to get his 17th PBA victory tonight. Webb crosses over, leaves the five pin, just finishing out the match right now. Pastor contemplating his next opponent. Kent Wagner was hitting him very well in practice. Let's see if he can do it when the lights are on. Nothing comes easy out here, though. You know that. Oh, yes. Anybody that makes the championship finals has obviously bowled well. There's no such thing as an easy match. Wayne Webb will finish up the week collecting a check worth $4,000. And although he's a little unhappy, I know that he's pleased with the fact that he did qualify for the championship finals. The final score in the opening match here in the Austin Open was Rod Pasteur, 208, Wayne Webb, 190. There's, there's a good look at the score, and Rod Pasteur, as Mike mentioned, will try his luck against Kent Wagner, who is up next. Seagram's Premium Wine Cooler Bowling News. Welcome to this week's edition, and with just five weeks left on the summer tour, three of the PBA's top players have now surpassed the $100,000 earnings barrier here in 1986. Here's a look at that current list. Marshall Holman and Walter Ray Williams Jr. are already above that six-figure mark, and regardless of where big Steve Cook finishes here this evening, he will have climbed over the $100,000 barrier for the first time in his nine-year career. Don Janello is currently number six on the 1986 money list, while Mike Albee and Tom Kreitz are also above that $65,000 mark. Dave Ozio and Mark Roth make up the rest of the top ten. And speaking of money, I've been keeping you updated on the Bowler of the Year race, and that race now takes on added significance. John Oliver, Director of Public Relations for Seagram Wine Company, along with Dick Evans, President of the Bowling Writers Association of America, announced earlier today that the winners of the BWAA Bowler of the Year in both the men and the women's division will be receiving a bonus check worth $5,000 each courtesy of Seagram's Cooler, and next week I'll give you an update on how the ladies are doing in their Bowler of the Year race, but thanks to Seagram's, a $5,000 check for both the men and the women. In other national bowling news, the Bowler's Journal Tournament is famous for its heavy pins, and so that's why everybody was really surprised when Kent Wagner set a brand new singles record this past year. Using a house ball, a ball that he picked up off the rack, he rolled games of 268, 226, 289, 246, and 255 for a sensational 1284 series and a whopping 256 average. Former touring pro Billy Spigner, along with Tim Cornelio, timmed up to split $4,000, capturing the doubles with a 1425 total. On the ladies' front, the largest women's tournament in the world wrapped up this past week out in Orange County, California, and better than 60,000 women participated. They put on an outstanding show. Here's a look at some of the results from that tournament. In the Open Division team event, a score of 28-91 took first place honors. And if you'll notice, there was a real battle for the all-events crown between Maria Lewis and Robin Romeo, who tied at 18-77. Joining me now is a man who has spent the last 25 years running roughshod over the touring players. He's the PBA's national tournament director, the distinguished Mr. Harry Golden. And who better at this point to give us an idea of how the players accrue points, PBA points, out here on the tour? Uh, well, Denny, there's only one way to accrue points, and that's Tanner and bowl in our national tournaments. You receive 100 points for every tournament you play in, and you'll receive bonus points for finishing in the top 144 places, anywhere from 2,000 for winning the tournament all the way to four points for 144th. 
Harry, through the years, I know there have been revisions in the way the points uh, have been given to the players. Well, Denny, since the inception of the PBA, we've had one form of a point list or another. In the early years, it was used to qualify bowlers to uh, play in the King of the Hill type TV series that were popular in those days. And then through the years, it evolved into our overseas invitationals. And we've been to such interesting places as Caracas, Venezuela, London, Paris, uh, Honolulu, and uh, this September I'll be taking 16 players to Tokyo for a second consecutive year. And Harry, there is one extra advantage to gaining points, especially for the players who are not exempt. Uh, definitely. It's every Turing player's goal to finish in the top 50 on the point list at the end of the year because it carries one year's exemption, a year without bowling the rabbits. And while we're on the subject of the current points, let's take a look now in 1986, how the points stack up. Dave Fusted, who has won two of the last four tournaments this summer, is currently on top of the stack with better than 19,000 points. Mark Baker and David Ozio currently round out the top five. In the number six position, it's Marshall Holman, and he is the current leading money winner at this point. Pete Weber, Amleto Monticelli, Steve Cook, and also Mark Roth currently rounding out the top 10. The bowling news is being brought to you by Seagram's Premium Wine Cooler. Welcome back. Denny Schreiner along with ESPN color commentator Mike Durbin. And Mike, the pros had their strike balls out this week. They certainly did, Dan. They had a lot of high scores and a lot of high games. We see that some of the 300s here. We had four of them this week. Bruce Carter had one. John Gant. Randy Peterson and Harry Sullins all had the 300s. Three 299s, one by Rick Sajak, whom we saw earlier this year. And we had also a couple of 290 games. So a lot of high games this week. We also had some high averages. The whole field averaged 208 this week. Lefties 209, right-handers 208. You needed 212 to cash. And to make that top 24, the finals, you had to almost average 218. Steve Cook dominated our match play record. He had the best match play, the most games over 200, and the most consecutive 200 games of 25. I guess the toughest thing about bowling on the PBA Tour, Mike, is the fact that some weeks you bowl pretty well and you still don't get a check. Well, it's a roller coaster existence out here, and you can't make money every week is the story out here. And every week we have a list with some of the prominent non-cashers. Mike Albee heads the list this week. Dale Eagle, who's been so hot this summer. Don Janello, who's won earlier this year. Veteran Larry Lobb, David Ozio, who won in Miami earlier this year, or I guess it was in Venice. And then Walter Ray Williams, a two-time winner. This winner failed to cash this week in Austin, Texas. Some of our other people, though, that did make money in cash this week, Pete Weber just missed the top five. Veteran and Hall of Famer Dave Sutar tied for 10th place. Some of the others, Sam Zurich finished in 15th place, and the great Mark Roth finished 16th. Butch Soper, who's been our stat man for some times, Bob Learn, we saw him earlier, finished 18th. Pete Couture, rolling well again this week. And the top 24 was rounded out by Steve Anderson. The Bowling News has been brought to you by Seagram's Premium Wine Cooler. Rookie Rod Pasteur has already cleared his first hurdle, but Kent Wagner is also looking for his first PBA title. They'll match up coming up next. Mike Durbin back with Denny Schreiner at the Highland Lanes, and here is Kent Wagner, four-step player, only 27 years old, and he's been on the PBA Tour eight years already. Drops the ball very quickly, hoists it back, and then snaps it through a very little slide. Not much hook, but he had a great shot in practice. He was throwing a lot of strikes, keeping the ball right in the 1-3 pocket area. He's yet to win on the PBA Tour, looking for that first victory, Dan. His wife, however, has been very successful on the LPBT tour, and she has been traveling with Kent all summer long, and I asked her what advice she had for helping him win the telecast here this evening. Uh, there's not a whole lot of advice that I can give him. I think about the only thing that I could tell him is to uh, not to let any bad situation that comes along get out of control, and most of all, just go out and have a good time. You've traveled with Kent this summer. You've had a chance to watch him bowl quite a bit. Uh, any advice uh, from the peanut gallery, uh, so to speak? Uh, no, I can't think of any. Just uh, have fun, really. 
uh, he's, he knows so much about lane conditions and the game of bowling itself that he doesn't really need any help. Now, what about practice on the national tour? I know most of the players practice diligently. Do you get a chance uh, to bowl against Kent once in a while? Yeah, we'll bowl in bowling centers around the town. Sometimes the bowling center that he bowls in during the week and we'll bowl matches against each other. To, it's interesting to see uh, who can beat who in certain cities, and it keeps us both in good practice. Now, they say that uh, you're not supposed to take your work home with you, so once in a while do you guys talk about bowling? We try and keep that away as much as possible from our conversations between the blocks. If he has a bad day, it's a good idea not to bring it home with you because it can just dwell on you and put you in much worse mood than you were already in. But if he has a good round, then you want to just kind of keep the, the situation good and, and hopefully it'll keep going the same way. At this point in time, you're currently the leading money winner on the LPBT Tour in 1986. What about your plans for the fall? My plans for the fall are to bowl the remaining tournaments. We have 10 of them left, four in August and then six in the fall. And physically willing, I'd like to bowl them all and hopefully keep going like I have at the start of the year. You are a former player of the year back in 1983. You have 10 professional titles, but there is still one goal that you haven't yet accomplished in your bowling career. Well, there's actually two. There's a long-term goal in that I would like to be bowler of the decade, and hopefully by then it will, it will be a very distinguished award. And another goal is I'd like to bowl David Letterman on the David Letterman show, a game of building bowling, where we, he drops bowling balls off a four-story building and I'd like to give him a challenge well I know one thing he probably carries the 10 pin every time well I guess it probably six pins don't go around it they just kind of land on top of each other I guess hmm building bowling have you, have you ever uh, tried that Mike no. <laughs> I wonder what it would do to the street does it be tough on the bowling balls too <laughs> David Letterman yeah dropping things off four-story buildings well Rod Pasteur I'd like to drop another shot right in the pocket. He'll open up match number two on the left-hand lane. Fresh from a victory over very tough Wayne Webb. Well, he's moving up, you know. Wayne Webb was only 5'5". Five, five. He's got a 5'6'er in here. Right. He starts with that light strike. Seems to have made a pretty good adjustment on the left-hand lane, although the strikes have not been solid, other than the one that really put Webb away the second shot in the tent. They don't have to be solid, then. They just have to all fall. I guess that's the whole key. 27-year-old Kent Wagner, bowling now out of Palmetto, Florida, has earned $21,000 this year. And that's what he was doing in practice right there. On the week, average 221.5 is high game this week, 279, and there were a number of high games here at Highland Lanes in Austin, Texas. Number of high scores all the way across the house all week long. Trying for an early lead. If he can take a double, make a double here on lane 19. Been a member eight years and uh, has still yet to step into the PBA winner's circle. Ooh, leaves the soft 10. He looks at his hand and what that means is I just didn't get enough fingers in that shot. I didn't get the lift that I wanted. Kent has uh, struggled a little bit in the championship finals is 0 for 3 overall but told me in two of the three matches he bowled very well just wasn't fortunate enough to win I remember one of them he lost to Marshall Holman who shot 290 at him it's hard to win games when the guy shoots 290 and uh, you don't win missing 10 pins either just a mental mistake there because I saw him practice 10 pins in practice he looks back at his wife and kind of a sick look on his face but that's what she was talking about in that interview not letting situations get out of control It's going to get somewhat out of control if Pasteur can double. And he gets the break and trips out that six pin. He doesn't appear to be, but he is a very intense player. Very cool, though. Watch the three pin. Third from the right. High hit. It goes to the wall and trips out both the six and the ten. Takes a 22 pin lead after two frames. Can increase it to 32 with one more. Rod attended Morehouse College in Atlanta, got himself a business degree there, so now that he's beginning to make money, obviously he knows how to invest it. Right. <laughs> oh, well. Hurry up. Oh. 
doesn't get the break and trip the six this time, leaves it. And his parents looking on right now. And can't tell how they feel by looking at him. But They've got their game faces on right that, now, Mike. Is that what it is? Sure. Reginald and Gloria passed her. Made the trip up and walked into the bowling center about five minutes before the championship final started. So obviously they're a bit harried. But they look like they're enjoying the festivities thus far. Your son has bowled very well. He knocked off one of the top players in the world in the opening match. Winner of this game will advance against... One of the strongest players on the tour, John Gant. Of course, Steve Cook, the top seed. The loser will take $5,000 home. We saw some of the high games that Kent Wagner's had this week. He's had a number of them. Leaves that 10-pin again. And he's starting to wave at him and mumble to himself. And that's uh, still early in the match. He's still well in the match. Just needs to get his thoughts together, get his emotions together, make the 10-pin, come back, and get a strike. Kent Wagner has bowled very, very well over the last month. As a matter of fact, he has made the top 24 finals the last three weeks as he applauds himself on lane 20 for sparing the 10-pin. As his wife Lisa looks on, it was a little bit of a sarcastic applause almost there for himself, wasn't it? Well, better late than never. Just got to figure out how to knock that 10-pin down on the first shot. Trails by 21, so it's time to get it in gear here in the fourth frame. Light and carries though. Five pin dancing around just a little bit. So a break for Kent Wagner as he tries to right himself. But the rookie Rod Pasteur currently leads here in match number two. Well, the tether will be flying. I'm sure the wind will be up, Mike Durbin. But uh, who's your pick in the British Open? Well, it's hard to pick anyone, but Raymond Floyd, you know, played very well in the, obviously, in the U.S. Open. Uh, and I'm sure that he has his sights set on trying to capture that major title also. And speaking of a guy who has his sights set on something, rookie Rod Pasteur. Nice shot. Excellent shot. He gets the line very squarely. I love his follow-through. Really throws the ball, I guess, much softer than the contemporary player, Mike. His speed reminds me of Earl Anthony. Same speed. with me. And uh, he hooks the ball a little bit more than Earl did, but uh, the speed is very similar. I really think that this young man's going to have a nice future ahead of him. Up by 21. Trying to increase it to 31. You sound a little bit excited there, Mike. Why was that? <laughs> well, you throw it that good, you're supposed to get 10. He leaves a solid 8-pin on a flush hit. I don't know what came back off out of the channel, but knocked that 8-pin over. Should have fallen the first time, Danny. A double in the fourth and the fifth. And Pasteur now leads by 31. But Wagner, working on a strike, needs a double here. Absolutely. Almost in a must-strike situation. <laughs> Try to give it a little bit extra. I mean, trying to lift it a little bit harder and just steered it up there toward the nose. Leaves the 3-6 here. Kent, however, though, is able to come from behind to bail out games. Last night, he got six in a row at the end of the game to save his spot on the telecast. And speaking of that spot on the telecast, I asked Kent earlier this evening if the number three slot was a good one to come out of to perhaps win his first title. Yeah, I think so. If I can get by the first match, I think I can go all the way. I haven't won a match on TV yet. I think that's a trick. Now, what about the fact that a lot of people say that your wife is a better bowler than you are? Oh, she definitely is. She's the greatest woman bowler there is, as far as I'm concerned. Well, he doesn't let that male ego get in the way, does he? <laughs> <laughs> Not when you're married to the leading money winner. You don't. Obviously, they have a... A great relationship, and really it's difficult. You know how tough life is out on the PBA National Tour and on the LPBT Tour. What I think, though, is going through Kent Wagner's mind, just judging from his talking head there, is he's thinking about winning that first game on television. 
and it's a, a, a major hurdle in his mind right now, as it appears to me. Ron Pasteur has struck in four out of five shots and would dearly love to mark himself a turkey here in the sixth frame. In a position to take a commanding lead. He throws a couple strikes here. Right through the heart and doesn't get any kind of break. Leaves the 2 4 7 10, loses count, and has a potential open here. Just a hair soft with the speed. Didn't get, didn't get the ball out on the lane. Looked like it was a little short. Look at how smooth he is. Nice long slide, how square he is. Good follow through there. Just appeared that he didn't get that ball out another three or four inches out on the lane. This is a makeable spare. He's got a chance. Ooh, hit it just hit the two pin a little bit too flush. Leaves the 10 and gives Kent Wagner an opening. You see here as he gives it a valiant effort, but the ball hooks a little bit too sharply at the end, catches too much of the two pin, misses the 10, and the lead now is down to 16 pins. If he'd have struck there, it'd have been 42. He opens it at 16. Trying to get back on track and does. An excellent shot on the left-hand lane. A rod Pasteur makes a mistake, but then comes back with a very, very solid shot. And he leads by 16 as he heads into the eighth frame. Next week on ESPN, the PBA Summer Tour is headed to Edmond, Oklahoma for the $125,000 Hammer Open. Live coverage on Wednesday night, beginning at 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, July 23rd. And the folks in Edmond are looking forward, Mike, to having the pros back in the Sooner State. Gary Dickinson's told me they've really done it up special, had uh, all kinds of special events for the pros, a golf tournament. They're really looking forward to having professional bowling back in Oklahoma. Kent Wagner trails by 16, but could cut the lead with a strike here. Working on a spare. And gets the 10 pin out of there that's this time. Sort of a gritty performance by both players in match number two. Lanes don't appear to be yielding many strikes, Mike. Big shot coming up here in the eighth frame for Kent, though. He's down by 16. A, a double here would do wonders for his confidence. It would do wonders for his attitude toward winning his first match on television. We see the difference there. 123 to 107, 16 pins. Very little time Kent takes. Well, he's taking a little extra this time. Quickly up to that line. He's coming in light. Not going to make it up. Is he going to get a break? No. Just again steering it that's confidence right there Dan that's the only difference the shot is there he's just not able to make his body do what his mind wants it to do right now it seems as if also when he gets into pressure situations that those feet continue to move faster and faster and when you get to the line a little ahead of your body that creates problems doesn't it well you spotted the exact problem there he has a, a, a different style not one that I would recommend I recommend pushing and stepping at the same time he drops that ball now and charges after it and I don't think that style is real as reliable under pressure as say a style like Rod Pasteur's is right here. This is more conventional, standard, like things we used to see, Dan. <laughs> when he's throwing it from the port side. Gave Light. that one plenty of room and nearly caught himself a break, and that seems to be the widest he has thrown the shot on the right hand lane. Was that a mistake, or do you think that was by design? Well, I think he wanted to get it wider and out of the lane. Remember the last time we said he was a little bit short over there. We, he wanted to give it room and get it out of the lane, and it just didn't quite make it back. He gave it a little too much room. Goes to show you that the game of professional bowling is one of constant adjustment. If you don't strike on your last shot, you have to decide to do something a little bit different on the next shot. Or if it's a tap, you have to discipline yourself that, that you have to keep making that same good shot and that the pins are going to fall. Ninth frame action, 16 pins, still the difference. Pasteur, should he strike out in the ninth and the tenth, would have a possible 233 game. Kent Wagner, if he goes off the sheet, is at this point. Shoot 207. Pastor going at a 203 pace right now, so he hasn't got it won, although he's in a commanding position. Foundation frame. Good speed. Oh, good shot. He looked like he stuck a little bit. Leaves the solid seven pin.
Ball goes into the one-two pocket. Watch the four pin second from the left as it just stays nice and low and it goes right around that seven pin. Never ceases to amaze me how you can throw a shot that good and not end up with a strike. And he didn't wind up with a spare either. He had missed the 4-7 in the first match when he went for the 4-7-10. And he's trying to give this match to Kent Wagner now. A little bit of inexperience on both their parts showing. But Wagner now sitting on the bench is only four pins down. And he can strike out to lock this match up. He can shut out Rod Pastor. How quickly it changes. Well, here's his chance. And he makes a bad shot again right through the heart. Leaves the three pin as he hits himself in the head. He has just not made the shots that he needs to make in the pressure situations in this game. This is just nerves, Dan. It's nothing more than nerves, and he just yanks on this ball, and it goes dead left of his target. He never got out of it clean. He's aiming about the sixth board. He hit the ninth, and he practices on the spare shot. He's fortunate to get nine and a spare out of that shot. 196 is the best that Kent Wagner could shoot if he strikes out in the 10th frame. Rod Pasteur, on the other hand, could shoot 201. So Wagner. the momentum switches back the other way, and Pasteur is now but again, in a position to do what he wants. But again, we're in the situation the bowler that performs in the 10th frame is going to win the match. Better shot. See, just the difference of just execution under the pressure. But the pressure really mounts now. This is to take the lead right now to make Pasteur double. That'll make Pasteur mark. This is to make him double. Kent Wagner is an excellent match play bowler. As a matter of fact, he won all eight of his matches last night in the sixth and final round to qualify. But what he's thinking right now, this is to win my first match ever on national television. Can I make that shot? Light. And gets the right hit. Gets the break. Pretty good shot and got the good break going to force Broad Pasteur to double. Well, with a lot of speed here, comes in light, the head pin goes to the wall, comes back off the wall, and gets the 4-5-7. Mike, players have their favorite shots in pressure situations. Do you think that Kent Wagner's is the frozen rope? Yes. The frozen rope, we mean a lot of speed. Light hit, gets nine. It's going to wind up with 195, I believe, is the final score. Broad is going to need a double and uh, five pins to win the match. And he goes over and checks the score with the tournament director, Harry Golden, looks at the rack, and again, Wagner did his job in the 10th frame. Now Pasteur has to say, I have to do my job. And we've seen this happen so many times in recent weeks on the PBA Tour. You have to play in the 10th frame to win out here. You can't do it any other way. Kent Wagner's not even looking on. He's got his head in, buried in a towel. Pasteur with his pressure shot, lets it go and likes it. And he uh, likes the is going to get himself a bit of a light hit. And, boy, you look at his face, and he doesn't appear to be affected at all. He is cool, isn't he? I'll tell you what, I really like this man's composure. Trusts it, gives it room, it comes in light, the ball is alive, the pins dance and fall. That is as good a pressure shot as you can make. The tendency under pressure is to cut it a little short and have it come up. Wagner wants this first win so badly but he doesn't dare look. That's he, the tough part of bowling, too. You don't get a chance to go up and stop him. You just got to sit there and wait for the reaction. Kent Wagner thinking back to that missed 10 pin in the second frame to win the match right here. Down to Brooklyn, it gets the break. Oh! Talk about a break. Rod scratches his head. He set it short from the get-go, really had no chance to end up in the pocket, crossed over, and the five pin sort of backed out of there. And Kent Wagner is beside himself at this point. And it wasn't even a good Brooklyn, then. It was not even a good Brooklyn. I think the head pin hit the 5-8. Yeah, but what was it you told me? When they all go down, it's a good shot no matter what? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you make my words come back to help me, huh? Rod Pasteur strikes out in the 10th. As a matter of fact, both players, really, when their backs were against the wall, answered the bell. Two strikes and nine for Wagner, but three strikes for Rod Pasteur, who has now won his second straight match, and we'll be back with more right after this.
it's never easy, Mike Durbin, but I think Rod is thinking back to that second shot in the tent that clinched the victory. Well, sometimes you need those breaks, and we're going to get a look at it right now. What I want you to watch is watch and see if the head pin hits the 5-8. He sets it, as you said, short and right of target. It has no chance to strike. It goes over to the Brooklyn side, but goes light Brooklyn. Now watch the head pin. The head pin flattens out, hits the two, Oh, I don't know. The two pin, I think, bounced back in there and hit the 5-8. That's the weirdest winning strike as I've ever seen. And there it is, though. 201 to 195. He's a winner. It's a W. Coming up next week on ESPN, the $125,000 Hammer Open from Boulevard Bowl in Edmond, Oklahoma, live Wednesday, July 23rd. And we move from there into uh, Canada for the Molson Golden Bowling Challenge. If I can get all that out, that's going to be 10 p.m., a different time, Eastern Daylight Time on July 30th. And certainly one of my favorite places, Cheek to Awaga, New York, Thruway Lanes, the $110,000 Buffalo Open. I've always enjoyed that particular tournament. The Seniors Touring Pro Doubles in Erlanger, Kentucky, live Wednesday, August 13th. Again, 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Well, this week, something just a little bit special. We don't have a bowling tip from Mike, but Mike did tour the National Bowling Hall of Fame in St. Louis, Missouri. Tonight, we have a very special feature for you. I'm here in St. Louis, Missouri at the National Bowling Hall of Fame and Museum. And tonight we're going to take a little walk through the history of bowling. No one really knows when bowling first started, but it may have started with a fellow like this, a caveman throwing a rock at bones stuck in the ground. He may have been the original Fred Flintstone. And maybe Fred's interest in bowling is not so far-fetched after all. From Fred Flintstone, we move to the earliest records of bowling, which are the barbaric Germans and they were sometime pre-1500. Bowling also had a religious significance in that church members would roll a stone at their kegel. Now the kegel was a stick they used for self-defense. They were to imagine that the kegel was the devil. Toppling the kegel symbolized the slaying of Satan. Martin Luther took this religious significance one step further. And as we can see from this display, Martin Luther was an avid bowler. He taught that keeping the ball on the lane and hitting the pins and out of the gutters symbolized staying out of the gutters of life. As we move on through history, our next stop is 1841, where Bowling's image began to suffer because of betting and rowdiness. This led to laws against bowling. This also led to the legend that to get around these laws, a 10th pin was added. And I once believed that, but now I find out that it's just a legend, it's not true at all. The earliest evidence of record of 10 pins is January 2nd, 1841. Between 1851 and 1900, four and a half million immigrants came from Germany and they brought their love of bowling and it helped rekindle the sport in America. As we move into the 20th century, we find what is depicted in this display and that is pin boys or pin roos or pin goose as they were called. These hardworking young fellows made between four and five cents a line for their efforts. And the way it worked was, well, excuse me here just a second, was that there were pegs in the pen deck here that came up as they pushed the lever at the back of the pen deck. They put the pins on the peg. As they let the lever go, the pegs disappeared from the pen deck. The pins had hole in the bottom to accommodate the pegs. And interestingly enough, today's pins, even though we obviously don't have those pegs anymore, still have that same hole in the bottom of the pin. And we'll show you a little more about this feature in a later segment. During the wartime years, bowling flourished thanks to full employment and travel limitations. Bowling was also used promotionally to increase more production in the wartime effort. This is the actual Hall of Fame room. In this room, all the members of the ABC Hall of Fame have their memorabilia, including trophies, records, and plaques. These plaques have their picture, their history, their records, their date of enshrinement. The men are in this section, and they include such famous names as Andy Verapapa, Don Carter, Dick Weber, Steve Nagy, Harry Smith, and many others, including our own PBA coordinator, Chuck Pisano. This is the Women's Hall of Fame, and in contrast to the men's dark room, this room is bright and light and sunny, I guess depicting women as the light of men's lives. Such famous names as Marion Lattawick, Laverne Carter, Merle Matthews, Shirley Garms, and of course many others 
have their portraits in contrast to the men's plaques depicted here. Well, that's our walk through a little bit of Bowling's history. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'd like to take this opportunity to invite anyone who is in or near the St. Louis area to come and visit this tremendous Hall of Fame. I know you won't be disappointed. It's as fine a Hall of Fame as you'll find in any sport. Rookie Rod Pasteur is two for two, but Big John Gant out of Cincinnati, Ohio is next to stand in line. We'll have the semifinal match in just one minute. Right now we have someone else who wants to go into bigger and better things, and that's John Gant. Rookie of the year in 1984, throws a true power ball from the left side of the lane. Say that many say that he gets as many or more revs as anybody in the sport of bowling. Has a very stiff-legged approach. He's six feet two, looking for his second PBA title. And many thought he would have more than that by this time, Dan. I guess it's safe to assume now that a left-handed player will win the $115,000 Austin Open. Well, what makes you think that? Well, I like <laughs> to stick my neck out once in a while, Mike. Well, I know you do. I don't do it often, but... <laughs> Of course, top seed Steve Cook is next well, after Rod, this match. Rod Pastor says those right-handers were easy to dispose of. Now mm -hmm. we got to get the lefties. They're the real tough ones. Sure. Opening shot in the semifinal match. And through the nose for Rod Pastor, who looks in disbelief. I think he thought he made a pretty good adjustment, but obviously did not. Well, leaves the 247. Relatively uh, medium-tough spare right now, but uh, see if he can convert it. Keep himself clean through one frame of the semifinal match. And then make that adjustment on lane 19 to get the ball back in the one-two pocket. Has the spare. And as this match started, our statistician Joe Berardi pointed to Gant's name and he says, this is going to be your winner. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. The buzzsaw had a chance to watch him bowl in the doubles tournament in Las Vegas earlier this summer. And you're in for a special treat if you like to see guys hook the bowling ball. More speed. Same result, only leaves only the two pin, right through the heart of the pin. John Gant, six foot two, 190 pounds, a big strapping left-hander, an excellent baseball pitcher. Threw for the Bearcats at the University of Cincinnati for four seasons and had a couple of professional offers in minor leagues, but decided to rather stick with bowling. Uh -oh. oh, well, it always comes back, Mike, when you've got a hook like that. Earlier this evening, since John was so successful yesterday in match play, I asked him what the key was to winning those head-to-head -head matches. Well, Monday, I was... I worked very well in my concentration, and, and it just seemed to work out real good. I, um... I took one shot at a time. I didn't worry about what the other guy did, and I just got into a groove, and, uh... And won all eight matches, so I made my big move then. Well, there's news right there. John Gant not carrying a light hit. <laughs> Those pins just dance. They're so lively when his ball hits the pocket. That extra revolutions that he gets. Many estimate that he gets close to 14 or 15 revolutions going down there. I don't know, really know how you'd count them. It's a blur. As the spare. John averaged 222.2 for his 42-game effort this week and had a high game of 300. Can't do any better than that. He's not going to have 300 tonight, though, not, at least not in this match. 300 this evening would have been worth $25,000 from True Value Hardware. Maybe the championship game. Gives it a lot of room. And knocks that seven pin out of that soft speed. How smooth he is. Five-step player. He's going to step out with that right foot there. Pushes it out. Now pushes it down the ball slightly early. Bends forward to compensate for that. Nice long slide. Look at the right arm out for balance. Now watch the follow-through and the head being still. Follow-through comes right out. He doesn't steer the ball. He just lets it go. Pasteur looking for the all-important double to open things up here in the semifinal game. It Gives it more room this time. Pretty adjusted. Beautiful shot. That was flush right when it left his hand. And so the rookie from Miami, Florida, has uh, taken the early lead, I guess, but a long way to go here.
John Gant with one PBA title, the 1984 Denver Open. Another five-step player. Gives it a lot of room. And it came back. Woo! Well, I hope we get a chance to take a look at this one. Contrasting style. Stands upright. Very short first step. Now pushes it out. Kind of late. Much later with the timing. Now watch the finish here. How stiff his right leg is right here at the finish. Just watch that ball finish in there. Light. And watch the four pins just nudge out that seven. Wow. Everybody's in a hurry there. Those pins are moving at a rapid rate. Looks for the double and washes things around. Oh! A marvelous break on lane 19. And that's what you call the old Louis Tion hesitation strike. As Gant doubles to match Pasteur's double. And we're deadlocked here in a dandy in the semifinal game. look at the past winners here in the Austin Open. PBA Hall of Famer Dave Sutar back in 81. Gary Skidmore won his very first title here in 82. Holman the Bowman in 83 and then Pete Weber who just missed finished sixth this week won in 84 and Guppy Troop the likable Guppy Troop wins in 85. There's some of the money that they're going to win. 4,000 for fifth, five fourth, six. The loser or winner of this match is going to be guaranteed at least 82.50 and 16 thousand dollars to our tournament champion that's what steve cook wants the bowling has been outstanding all week long but uh, there is a sad note to report this week all of us at espn the pba players the pba staff who have all worked so closely with pat fitzpatrick the tournament manager of this event for so many years join with his many friends and wishing him deep and sincere sympathy on the death of his wife lois earlier this week a lot of room. And he says to John Gant, if you can do it, so can I. Well, you get a, begin to get a picture of why the left-handers scored as well as they did here because Rod Pasteur gave that ball a lot more room. They have what they call swing area. The ball will definitely come back for them. Pasteur working on three in a row, up by 11 pins, can increase it to 21. Pasteur has been receiving a bit of a break. His opponents were only averaging 192 against him thus far this evening. Well, that's because they've been right-handed, don't they? See, so. Oh, now don't get started on that. <laughs> I mean, facetious. They all have to go down. And he leaves the six bit. You're always in the middle of that controversy, aren't you? I guess it's part of my nature. Constantly. But that's why we're all here, right? He's going to start this ball out close to the second arrow. And the ball goes out to around the fourth or fifth board, and it makes that sharp turn right. <laughs> and he leaves the six pin there and almost left it on the second shot as it just nicked it going by. The wind knocked it over. The spares have been uh, a very exciting part of this evening's telecast. And here's his spare shot here. Watch it. The breeze knocks this one over here. Just don't hit it too hard. It might be the head pin the next time. Talk about heart failure. Gant looking to even the match. <laughs> well, he could certainly throw strikes. A former Sporting News Rookie of the Year, as I mentioned back in 1984, he won his very first title, and also a record $43,370. So John Gant, in his professional career, really got off to a very fast start, although he was one of the best amateur bowlers in the country before he turned pro. I've been hearing about this guy from Irv Hoinke for a number of years. And uh, Irv Hoinke, of course, has a famous tournament, Cincinnati, Ohio, and he happens to be the sponsor of this young man. I think that's money well spent. That's good investment. Trying for four and the lead. And doesn't get the pin to fall over this time. Leaves the soft seven, keeping the match nice and tight. John Gantz, power ball. Snaps it out there. A lot of wrist and turn. And it's impossible to count all those revolutions. But every time you see that white coming up, that ball's turning over. 13, 14, 15, 16. <laughs> so right, and our director, Ken Samuel, in the truck, <laughs> counting those. And it just goes to show you that the production people will go to all costs to come up with the right answers. There's no doubt about it uh, that uh, our producer, Jim Rosenberg, and Ken Samuel are here to provide us with all the information. And plus a lot of <laughs> kidding tidbits in our ear, yes. <laughs> Pastor trying to get back on track and does. He's really got that right lane nailed. 
I think both of these young gentlemen, Mike, realize that the winner of this game bowls for the championship. And between the two of them, we only have one PBA title. So it's uh, something that they really both desire. Pasteur probably a little bit more than Gant. One pin separate them right now, going into the seventh frame. Pasteur, um, what's the word, inscrutable? He just uh, you can't tell how he he's feeling from looking at his face. I never was able to do that. <laughs> probably a marvelous poker player. <laughs> I never was a good poker player either. Neither was I. Oh, wow. Yeah. 19, so Pasteur comes back with a big double of his own. He still trails by 11, but he's in the hunt. We'll be back with the conclusion right after this. And I'm getting just a little bit confused and excited. I mentioned that Pasteur trailed by 11, but he does lead by 11 heading into the eighth frame. Kent zips it out there again. Leaves the seven pin and the messenger says ball over. Interesting to see what pin that was. We're gonna get a look at it. I think it's the head pin. Let's watch that head pin. As the ball comes in what we call half pocket behind the head pin. The head pin goes to the wall, bounces out of the channel, and it is definitely is that head pin coming across to give the message to the seven pin to fall over. Mike, how long is it from the time that the ball drops over the edge of the lane from when the rack comes down? ABC rules say I think it has to be three and a half seconds. And there's the double. He took advantage of it. Didn't need the three and a half seconds on that shot. No, he didn't. Just to give you a little history of the match between these two guys last night, Rod Pasteur was the winner. A low-scoring game. He beat John Gant 203 to 168. One pin separating him right now. Pasteur working on a double. Semi-final game. And it's been outstanding. Gives it room. Oh! Fans here at Highland Lanes in Austin, Texas, very appreciative of the effort. Well, a lot of people, not a lot, but some have gotten their first title. I remember when Gary Skidmore did it back, I think, in 1981 or 82. Skidmore, I think, went through the field that day, won three or four games on television. Both players pretty well lined up at this stage. It's a matter of executing right now. They know where to throw the ball. It's just a matter of making your body do it. Ninth frame gives us some more room. And he gets the same break. Woohoo! Well, he wrote that one off. Pasteur, there's no way in the world he figures that this ball is going to strike. And we're going to watch the six pin here. Watch the six pin. Second from the right is going to come off the sideboard. I think it's the six pin anyway. No, it was the head pin. That head pin's been active. It came off the sideboard and got the, the three. Pasteur with a possible 269 if he would strike out in the tenth. Gant in a must strike situation here. And he responds beautifully. Neither bowler has let the good break of the other player disturb them confidence-wise. There we see the situation going into the 10th frame. Both players, well, Gant working on a turkey, Pasteur on a four-bagger, and the difference, 11 pins. Gant right now, if he gets this one, cuts the lead to one. So for the third match in a row, the player who performs in the 10th frame, I'm getting to sound redundant here, is going to win. But that's something that the pros expect for the most part, don't they, Mike? You do that all week long in match play. Absolutely. Exactly right. John Gant uh, taking a few extra moments, and he has decided to re-rack on li uh, lane 19, I should say. Is he buying time, Mike, or do you think he was really uh, displeased with the way the pins were set? I think he was displeased. Interesting, he had originally picked to finish on lane 20 and switched it at the last minute to finish on 19. He needs a strike here to stay in the hunt. That's the best way to get one. Wow, that is just power plus. And he's bowling with a great deal of confidence. Can't throw it any better in this right flush in the one-two pocket. All ten pins will disappear off the pin deck into the pit. Still trails by one pin. 
one more puts him in the 250s down. These two young players have been very impressive under pressure. Ty leaves the 4-7 just a little short with the follow through that time. That's the pressure that does that. He, he knew where to throw it. He just couldn't make himself trust it like he wanted to. As soon as he let it go, he knew that uh, it was going to be high. He knew he'd just cut it off. He'd made such a great shot. First shot in the 10th. He's still in the match. He's going to be down by three pins. At the 4-7. Has the two pins. Finishes up with 246. Normally, 246 is good enough to win, even in the semifinal game, but that may not be the case. And our statistician, Joe Berardi, says that Rod Pastor is going to need nine spare nine. And that is much more difficult than it sounds. What he's thinking is strike. He's thinking strike locks it up. He's looking at that rack. He's been very cool, confident all day long. But this is extreme pressure now. He's really getting his baptism of fire right now. Looking to win his third consecutive match and reach the finals for the first time in his very young career. A lot of room. A lot of room. And oh! Boy, the soft speed that time got the ball back. How does this happen, Mike? These pins continue to fall later and later. Watch it. The head pin goes to the wall, barely got the three. The pins dance and tickle and wiggle and wobble, and they do the hula out there and fall over. That's the leaning tower of nine pin. Gee, here's his Christmas. reaction. Had it all the way. He's not embarrassed at all. He says, I had it all the way, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a rookie on the run right now, and he mentioned earlier this evening, hey, I'm just going to go out there and take it one shot at a time, and if I do well, I'm just not going to worry about what the other guys do. Well, he's been getting the breaks. He's been bowling well, but the breaks have gone his way also. And he's in a position to fill out here in the 10th and shoot 269. There it is. Well, he'll have to settle for 268, but it was more than enough as Rod Pasteur now advances into the title match against top seed Steve Cook. The final score, 268-246. Back at the Highland Lanes, this is Rod Pastor's first strike in the 10th frame. And what he does here, Dan, is he throws the ball very slow, but he throws it wide. Out around the first arrow, but he threw it slower. So right now it's starting to come back to the hip and watch the hip and barely nick the three and come back and dance and twist and knock out the nine and the 10 both. The head pin really has done a lot of damage in this game. And Rod Pastor certainly knocked down Quite a few pins in the semifinal match as he defeats a very game John Gant, 268, 246. Steve Cook, 6'7", 265 pounds, a power player, five-step player, stands very erect, pushes that ball away, very high backswing, and cups that ball at the top, nice and low at the finish, right arm out there for balance, powerful player, has won three times already this year, is looking for his fourth title, and maybe with it, Bowler of the Year honors. Do you think, Mike, that in Steve's mind he realizes uh, how maybe Ride will be reacting to his first shot at a title match? I think he's definitely thinking that. I really think that Steve Cook would rather bowl Rod Pastor than he would John Gant. John Probably. Gant was really lined up and was just drilling strikes. And I think that Cook thinks he has a distinct advantage right now bowling a rookie for this title. But Rod Pastor has answered every challenge. He's been cool, calm, and collected. This is a chance for him to win his first title, and a first title for a, a black man in the PBA. Willie Willis came awful close. Willie times. Willis won our resident pro championship, but that was the, against resident players. It wasn't right. a national PBA title. But he Char also made telecasts Charlie, on the national tour. Charlie Venable got close. Mm -hmm. We've had a number of, there was a player, Williams, in the past that got on, on the national telecast. Opening shot of the title match. Is it a good one? You bet, but a solid seven pin. We haven't really seen many of those, I guess simply because Mr. Pasteur has been playing the light hit this evening. Plus that soft speed keeps the pins down low and he's been carrying very well. That slower, softer speed. 
He almost seems like a, pair, a player from a, from a different era, almost the lacquer era. Yes, he does. And for those who don't know what we're talking about, the finish on the lane says he makes his first seven pin. Used to be lacquer and is now generally throughout most bowling centers in the country, urethane, which is a harder finish and gives a more violent reaction than lacquer used to. Steve Cook out of Roseville, California, 10-time PBA champion. Currently leads the tour in 300 games this season. His high game this week, 278. I think he'd love to pencil that in here in the title match. Right through the heart of the pins. Leaves the 247. I'm noticing now, Mike, that uh, Rod Pasteur has uh, his head down in his hands. I don't think uh, he's going to watch Steve Cook bowl at all here in the title match. Maybe just concentrate on his own game. This is the most important game of his career, obviously. It's much more important to him than it is to Steve Cook. Although it, to Steve Cook, it's extremely important, too, because Bowler of the Year may ride on it. Mm -hmm. And he is right in the thick of that race. And, boy, it's turned out to be a terrific race. Tough spare. Has it. Nice conversion start the match off with. Steve Cook averaged better than 224 this week. He is currently averaging 212 thus far, as far as the tour is concerned. He's an outstanding bowler from the top seat of position. I asked him what the key was to win here this evening from the number one spot. Well, I'm just going to come out and uh, be real aggressive and try to throw uh, 12 good shots and not really worry about who I'm throwing. And if I do that, I think I can win it. And back in 1981, I believe it was, he came out to the Firestone Tournament of Champions and threw the first 10 strikes in a row against Pete Couture. Oh, I remember that. On his favorite of the two lanes. Ooh. Same thing that Rod Pastor did, solid seven. Career earnings for Steve Cook in nine years as a PBA member, better than 532,000. Regardless of what he does here this evening, win or lose, he will surpass the $100,000 mark for the first time in his career. And he said, you know, that, that's a milestone, Denny. I'm very pleased I was able to do that. It's a, a kind of a, a hidden goal or in the back of the mind goal with every professional bowler starting the year that they like to get to that $100,000 mark. Plus, there's still quite a bit of the year left. Crossley at the seventh pin, Hard and straight. Makes it. He throws everything hard, doesn't he? I really don't think he throws that first ball that hard. I think he really is, is a power stroker player. He's similar to Marshall Holman on the right, mm -hmm. only not in physical stature, but in, in the, the uh, way they throw the bowling ball. Although Holman, of course, doesn't have a big high backswing or anything, but they both are power strokers. 25-year-old Rod Pasteur out of Miami, Florida. On the right-hand lane. There it is. Going high on the Brooklyn. And he says, uh, I'll take those. Shakes his head as he walks back. What does that do to a guy like Steve Cook uh, when you're sitting on the bench and a guy throws a Brooklyn? You, does, you best just don't watch it as he crosses over here and hits a perfect right-handed strike. And uh, they all fall down. He got one of those to win against Kent Wagner. I never cared when I went Brooklyn. I used Which to, was most of the time. I used to early in my career, and I learned quickly not to care. <laughs> Never be too proud to take that X. The 4-7 and the pressure of the title match telling. If you just kind of steered that ball, try to steer it into the 1-2 pocket to get that early lead. And you can see the tension written all over his face right now. Cross lane at the 4-7. Can't make any mistakes and give Cook an easy or early lead by a mistake of your own. Yeah. Doesn't. Rod Pasteur has already defeated Wayne Webb, Kent Wagner, and John Gant. He qualified in the number four position. And this seems to be a summer of the lower guys on the stepladder because they have been marching towards the top here as of late. We saw Dale Eagle do it. We saw Dave Houston do it. Steve Cook trailing by a single pin in the third. And once that light hit, Cook 
is a very animated player. If he gets a string of strikes going, or just even a few in a row, he's going to be moving around. And that's 260 pounds moves very quick on the approach. And what's really frightening is if he's crossing next to you in the qualifying round, and he were bowling on lane 21, and you're on lane 20, and he gets a strike, and you've just stood up there, he goes running those strikes back. It's like getting run over by the refrigerator. Exactly. No fun. His hands are so big, he uses two rosin bags. Can you believe that? Look at his high games, 278, 278, 259, to take the lead right here in the fourth frame. Uh oh, Ooh, and he liked that all the way. So a big double for the top-seeded giant, Steve Cook out of Roseville, California, back with the conclusion of the Austin Open right after this message. Rod Pastor needs to collect his thoughts. I think that commercial break came at an opportune time for Pastor right now to help settle him down so he can get back into this match. Pastor on a spare and through the nose. What has he had? He's had only one split that I can recall on tonight's telecast. And this is where he, he uh, did not get any count on it at all. Right. He left the 4 7 10 every time he. He's gone through the nose. He's gotten the good break and broken up the split. I say as many times as he's fiddled around with that head pin this evening, he's gotten away unscathed other than the one shot. Tough spare here, the 2-4-7. He's in trouble. And it comes back. Ooh, wow. Almost got a bad break there. Looking at that ring finger right now, maybe he's... Might have a blister on that ring finger. Last night I uh, noticed in the position round game that his uh, the base of his thumb there was having a little bit of a problem, but obviously shook it off. And you are well aware, Mike, that uh, many times you have to bowl with a very sore hand, and that's just part of the game. Yeah. When you get to bowl for the title, you don't worry about it at that stage. He's been out of the pocket almost every time in this final match, and is out again. This time he has a split, the 2-7. And he just has failed to make the adjustment right now. Either the lanes are breaking down a little bit more, or he, because he's just a little bit extra nervous for the champ title match, is a little bit softer. I would have to believe that he would approach this game a little bit differently than any of the other ones he's bowled here this evening, simply because of the exemption, the win, the trip to the Firestone Tournament of Champions in Akron. There's a lot on the line. Nice conversion, more speed. That's what he needs on the first shot, that extra speed. Steve Cook now in a position to really put the heat on the rookie. Cook leads by 14, and he is working on a double, shooting in the fifth. And we should correct something that we said earlier before Cook put some heat on us, and that's we've been giving him 10 titles all show long, and uh, he has 11. He won the PBA doubles to start our ESPN telecast this summer. So he's trying for his 12th. PBA victory here and even does it. Steve Cook five and six from the top seated position in his career lets it go. It's a little high, does not get the break, and he'll leave the six pin. And he's standing right in front of the pins with me, and I can't even see the pins. <laughs> I'm going to have to look at the monitor because he blocks them out. <laughs> blocks out all that sunshine. The thing that's so amazing about Steve Cook. For those of you who have ever had the chance to watch him bowl in person, he is so agile at 6'6", 6'7", six, 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 and 250, 60 pounds. He would have made a great tight end. Or a basketball player. I imagine he could probably clear out the paint pretty well. He and Charles Barkley, huh? <laughs> Cross lane at the six pin. He is an awesome sight as uh, he asked for a re-rack on lane 19. It always amazes me about Steve Cook. Watch as he hits the peak of this backswing, how he cups that hand over that ball. It's hard to see right there, but he just cups it right around there. I don't know how those guys did do that. I couldn't do that then. For Steve Cook, I don't know, it was almost like Wilt Chamberlain when he used to be able to palm a basketball. When your hands are that big, or like Julius Irving, you can do so many things that other players can't do. You notice my hands are nice and small. Mm-hmm. Cook trying to get back on the strike pattern. Light breaks it down, leaves only the three pin. He thought that ball was going to make it. While well, we've got a moment, Steve Crushan, award-winning writer, past president of the Bowling Writers Association of America and a former ABC 
Hall of Famer is ailing in a Detroit area hospital, and we join with his many friends across the country and wishing him a full and speedy recovery. Come on, Steve. Time to get back up and get on the approach. Yeah, I hope he's watching, Steve. We all wish you well and want to see you up and at him again. At the three pin. What he's done, though, is he's kept Rod Pastor in the match. Pastor, who... Only time he's hit the pocket in this championship match was the first frame when he left the seventh pin. It's been four consecutive high hits, high or Brooklyn. So he's got to make some kind of adjustment here. And does. All snapped just a little high again, leaves the sixth pin. Eight pin almost stood up on that trip, too. Do you think, Mike, that maybe Rod is just starting to wear down a little bit? You know, he's had to strike uh, in the 10th frame of all three of his other matches in order to win, and doesn't that take a toll on you mentally? It does take a, a toll on you emotionally, but he seems to be the type of player that keeps himself under control and holds that emotion in. As we've mentioned, Rod is a rookie, and he is uh, currently uh, in the race for Rookie of the Year honors. Thus far this year, he has won nearly $13,000. So he'll go over the $20,000 mark regardless of what happens here in the title match. His career earnings, $24,580. He has won better than $11,000 in regional play alone before coming out on the national tour. This is not the region, though. <laughs> yeah. Steve Cook's a little tougher than some of those guys yeah, yeah. that are back home. Good shot, just not quite the lift. He arced that ball more, but you see the penalty there sometimes for that soft speed. The ball didn't have any power. Watch the ball deflect as it hits the one-two pocket here. And then watch the four pin go into the channel but not have enough power on it to come out and get the seven pin. And his mother looks very worried, doesn't she? Crossley well, for the time being, but uh, he's taking care of business lately. At the seven pin, must make this. Has it. Steve Cook will now stand up in the seventh frame, and he leads by 14. Cook, thus far in his TV career record, 30 wins, 22 losses, and 31 appearances, averaging a fraction better than 212 per game. He's tough on TV, I know. I've lost to him. <laughs> I, oh my goodness, the four, six, seven, ten, double pinochle, and we've got a close match. There's his wife, Candy, looking on. And she's looking at the score, I have a feeling. She knows the score. He's going to put himself behind in this match by two pins if he gets eight out. What he's going to do, though, is he's going to throw hard at two of them and hope something bounces around. Before he does that, though, he'll check with Harry Golden, National Tournament Director, and uh, take a look at Harry Golden's scoreboard. Just to make sure. Cook was uh, moving right along here in the title match until that air. At the 6-10, firing hard. Whew. Oh. Almost. Almost bounced him out of there. Almost got to move it in the right direction. Out. And we see right there, he has 131 through the seventh frame. Pasteur, 113 in the sixth. Pasteur is leading in this championship match by two pins. Pastor with his right hand holding his left arm. He looks like he's hurting, but he's just thinking. In his mind, trying to figure out what exactly he will do in his next frame. Steve Cook needs a strike. Light again, high light. Again. He's just, he has lost his own rhythm. He's perplexed. The lane is not reacting like he wants to. He's been light, high, light. And Steve Cook may be thinking about bowler of the year right now. And that's why suddenly the pocket is getting more narrow or narrower for him. Sometimes uh, the pocket looks minuscule, doesn't it, Mike? <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Almost microscopic in some cases. And then other times it looks like a bushel basket. Taking a lot of times, even at the spare. As the three pin, which he missed one time last year 
in Peoria. He missed a three pin to lose a match that he probably would have gone on to win the tournament. Eighth frame action, Pasteur, who has only one strike in this championship match, and that was a Brooklyn strike. In fact, we've only had three strikes by both players. This is a battle of who can gut it out. Battle of nerves. Looks good. Looks good and is good. Stayed down solid at the line on lane 20 and made sure that he fitted the pocket. Head so still, nice long slide, good follow through, and just a very calm reaction, much calmer than the spectators in the background. They're going crazy. Pasteur, should he strike out as a possible 223? Steve Cook, if he went all the way off the sheet, would shoot 211. Pasteur, the foundation, if he gets this one, no matter what Cook does, he can't shut out Rob. Ninth frame. Come on! Yeah! Oh, and he's been getting good breaks the whole tournament, the whole night, and now he gets a bad break, leaves the 9-10 on a light pocket hit. Watch the head pin. The ball comes in light. The head pin flips the three would hit the five and knock that nine pin out. The head pin does not hit anything else. He has to fit the ball in between these two. He knocked that down to beat John Gant. Same hit. Identical hit to beat Gant in the 10th frame. Not much room between the nine and the 10. He's going to give it a roll, though, and just doesn't make it. So as Cook opens, so does the rookie, Pasteur. Now a possible 191, the best Pasteur could shoot. And Steve Cook has all the momentum in the world. The only problem now is he's got to figure out how to strike on lane 20. Up by 10 pins. Cook is going at a 191 pace right now. He moved an extra board to the right. Gave it more room. Light leaves the three pin. And he stares at it and says, you're not doing what I want you to do. <laughs> Steve Cook tried to coax that ball right back into the one-two pocket, but just couldn't seem to stretch out there and reach back and put it on a string. Right now, both players can hit the pocket, can't hit the pocket, and are struggling all the way through. Cook, who takes a lot of time, all the time, is taking even more time now. At the three pin. And not too solid, but he makes it. I'll tell you what, the, the nerves here are, are crumbling. Well, if he doubles, that would just about wrap things up. And he's very well aware of that fact, Steve Cook is. Looking for a career PBA title number 12 and his fourth in 1986, which I think would probably move him ahead of the stack in the race for Bowler of the Year, and he'll also become the leading money winner. And we see the scoreboard right there. Cook is potential 200 even if he strikes all the way out. The best pass to can get is 191. Again, the player that performs in the 10th frame. Six man Pasteur still alive. Rod Pasteur is going to have a chance to win his first PBA title if he can do what he's done the whole night long, that is strike in the 10th frame. He's going to need two of them, assuming that Cook makes this six pin. Well, the score is a little lower on this week's telecast, but the match is just as exciting. All four have come down to the 10th frame. And that's money time on the PBA Tour. Cook taking even extra time at the spare, taking nothing for granted. Has the six pin. Count is still important. Cook, well, if he strikes, winds up with 189. Pasteur would need two strikes and nine in the 10th frame to win his first PBA title. A tie is still possible. That would be interesting. Especially seeing as we're running out of time. <laughs> Cook unleashes the strike ball, and he knew it right from the beginning that it was a perfect shot, and Steve sort of chuckles as he walks off the approach, but now the pressure is laid heavily on the shoulders of 25-year-old Rod Pasteur. And Pasteur has only two strikes in this championship game, both of them coming on lane 20 
and he needs to get two more right here. Has to take them one at a time. Steve Cook's banner is hanging on lane 20. I wonder if Pasteur has taken a look at that. Gives it to the room. It's high. Oh. And Cook is the winner. And Rod Pasteur obviously disappointed. A game effort. A game effort by the rookie, but Steve Cook is the winner of the $115,000 Austin Open. A very happy Steve Cook. He collects $16,000 in first place prize money from the co-owners here at Highland Lanes. Jerry Ray and also Harry Peterson, wife Candy, along with daughters Stacy and Jill. A very happy Cook family here in Austin, Texas. Tonight's telecast has been brought to you by True Value Hardware Store. The more you've got to do, the more you need True Value Hardware Store. We've got what it takes. Coming up next Wednesday night on ESPN, it's the $125,000 Hammer Open Live from Edmond, Oklahoma, beginning at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific.